This year, the Arab world erupted as a generation of young people, no longer prepared to suffer in silence, rose up against the hated despots who ruled their countries. Gaddafi has destroyed our country, and now we can't test the freedom. But the way these revolutions began caught the world off guard. The weapons of the activists of the so-called Arab Spring weren't guns and bombs, but the internet and the mobile phone. For the first time in history, world-changing events were recorded hour by hour by the man and woman on the street. A unique filmed record now exists, charting the downfall of tyrants in Tunisia, Egypt and Libya. <laughs> and exposing the unimaginable brutality of embattled regimes in other parts of the Arab world. I'm now heading to the region to track down the people behind these images. Somebody had to show the outside world what was happening. I'll piece together the story of the revolutions through their eyes. He's abandoning his position as president of the republic. I ran into the street. I started to cry. I laid down on the street and looked up at the sky and I couldn't believe it and we all hugged each other. And I'll meet the activists whose struggle is still going on. These are the last moments of someone's life. Few visitors to Tunisia ever get beyond its Mediterranean beach resorts. But as you travel south, you enter a different world, rural, poor, and largely forgotten. 150 miles south of the Tunisian capital lies the small market town of Sidi Bouzid. It was here in December 2010 that the dramatic suicide of a young fruit seller would ignite revolution in Tunisia and send the Arab world into turmoil. In the past, what happened here could have been suppressed, censored from newspapers and television. But something of worldwide importance was about to happen. Disenfranchised people everywhere were about to discover that the internet revolution had tipped the balance of power in their favor. <laughs> 26-year-old Mohamed Bouazizi supported a large family selling fruit on the streets of Sidi Bouzid. For years, he and his fellow fruit sellers had been tormented by corrupt local officials who demanded backhanders at every turn. We wanted to get on with our work, but they wouldn't let us. They called what we did a public disorder. We had to pay a lot of bribes to get our stuff back. And when we asked why, they would ignore us. That's what it was like. On Friday, December the 17th last year, Mohamed Bouazizi set up his stall near the central mosque, but he didn't have the money needed to pay the bribes to be there. On Friday, he went and he set up his stall to start selling his produce. And then a policewoman arrived and took everything off him. As the tension mounted, a crowd started to gather. She stood in front of him, smacked him in the face, spat at him, and she swore at him. He got very upset and started crying, and the other police officers were kicking him in the shins. Humiliated, Mohammed headed here to the town hall, where he tried to lodge a complaint, but it fell on deaf ears. They didn't want to listen to him. They didn't want to open the door to him. He was terribly upset and disappointed. He lost his confidence, self-control, his hope. When he left here, he went to a nearby shop and bought a bottle of fuel. He returned here with the fuel 
chose the spot in front of the same building, poured the fuel over himself, and then set himself alight. Horrifically injured, Mohammed was taken to hospital. In this small, closely knit town, word traveled fast. Bouazizi's frustration struck a chord both here and across the Arab world. Mohammed burned himself because he had no job, no money, and no prospects. The next day, hundreds of people gathered at the spot where Muhammad had set himself alight. Men and women who, like him, struggled to make ends meet and felt their government wasn't listening to them. Among them were two of his friends, Wissam Gidri and Bassam Shikri. The people started shouting and asking questions in front of the town hall, asking the governor why Bouazizi had burned himself and no one had listened. Slowly, slowly the situation started to heat up. Demonstrations were almost unheard of in Tunisia, but in every protester's pocket was a tool to show the world what happened, a mobile phone. Wissam and Bassam explained to me how that night the demonstration turned into a street battle. We started a peaceful demonstration, but the police tried to crush us violently. We had to defend ourselves. We started throwing stones, anything we could get our hands on. Soon it became a confrontation. They were throwing tear gas at us. That night, the confrontation became a street war. We started lighting anything we could get our hands on. We were throwing stones, and they were shooting live bullets. But despite the rarity of the events in Sidi Bouzid, Tunisian state television reported nothing of what was happening. Tunisia may have been a popular holiday destination, but under the leadership of Zina Labedin Ben Ali, it was also a police state where the press was censored. Wissam and Bassam decided to take matters into their own hands. Somebody had to show the outside world what was happening. As the battle intensified, they made sure that they captured the evidence. Police were looking for anyone filming to arrest them. But we had people filming from the front line and from the rooftops. They weren't professionals, but they knew how to do it. Filming from hidden vantage points, they got shots from every angle. They knew there was one way to show the images to people across Tunisia, Facebook. Tunisia had two million Facebook users, or one in five of the entire population. While Ben Ali blocked access to political sites, he rarely interfered with Facebook, viewing it as purely recreational, somewhere for people to discuss football scores and dating. 
In the capital Tunis, a young computer programmer, Slim Amamou, spotted the extraordinary footage coming out of Sidi Bouzid. The video I saw showed burned out cars, young people throwing stones, and it was a video taken on a mobile. One of the young people throwing stones was saying, who is going to let our voice be heard? We're not animals, so why are we being ignored? On the face of it, Slim Amamou and his friend, computer engineer Aziz Amami, had little in common with the fruit sellers of Sidi Bouzid. They were university educated, privileged, the children of the well-to-do. What they shared was a hatred of their president and a frustration that they couldn't speak freely in their own country. Ben Ali was so stupid and arrogant that he wouldn't let anyone have a laugh about him. And when you can't have a laugh, you can't criticize. You can't have a view, and you can't even have your own personality. That's what made me hate him most. Ben Ali liked to portray himself as a modern, enlightened leader. But in reality, he was one of a cluster of dictators controlling the Arab world, including Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, and Bashar al-Assad in Syria. They rigged elections and tortured dissidents. Ben Ali's corruption was notorious. He enriched himself at his people's expense, and his personal fortune was said to be more than three and a half billion pounds. For more than five years, Slim and Aziz had been writing blogs satirizing the regime, sharing their grievances with other dissident bloggers in the region. Looking at all the dictatorships in the Arab world, you could see them all as part of one single dictatorship. A collective consciousness emerged via the Internet because the Internet is immediate. In fact, the Tunisian bloggers had access to one of the most advanced internet infrastructures in the Arab world. A quarter of homes had broadband, 90% of Tunisians a mobile phone. In his bid to modernize his country's economy, Ben Ali risked exposing his citizens to unwelcome outside influences. His solution was the censorship of all political sites. But for this tech-savvy generation, censorship was no obstacle. The beauty of the internet is that there is no single central hub, but instead an infinite number of pathways to communicate. By routing messages through networks in other countries, they were able to avoid Tunisian censorship altogether and gain access to any forbidden site. If they were caught posting subversive material online, the bloggers faced detention and torture. Fear is an enemy. You can't live when you're afraid. As I saw it, what blocked Tunisia was this cycle of fear, and we had to start breaking the cycle of fear. When the activists saw the footage coming out of Sidi Bouzid, it was the opportunity they'd been waiting for. And for me, that really changed everything. It was truly the trigger for direct confrontation. Slim and Aziz posted the videos on their own Facebook pages. It didn't take long for them to go viral. And the videos were broadcast on the internet and social networks at lightning speed, at a speed that was uncontrollable. Within days, the phone footage was picked up by the Arab satellite channel Al Jazeera and was being seen across Tunisia. Copycat demonstrations now broke out close to Sidi Bouzid in the southern towns of Kasserine and Medinin. But the capital, Tunis, remained stubbornly quiet. We said it's now or never. Tunis must be mobilized. 
Sidi Bouzid, Kasserin, Medanin, which had started to move, they must be sent the message that Tunis is with them, that they are not alone in their struggle. 